right. Well, welcome back to the church at Estrella, or if it's your first time, welcome. We are so glad that you are here and you've decided to make us a part of your week. And for everybody that's joining us online, live streaming, we're glad that you are with us today as well. Well, we are in week two of our series called anti-heroes. And this is such a fun series. We are in the book of Judges. If you have your Bibles, you can start pulling it out and looking and finding the book of Judges. But that's where we're at. Today we're actually going to be in Judges chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at uh, verses 12 through 30. So um, I know that uh, the physical Bible is not as popular. That's okay. I brought mine today because I'm using it as a point. Usually I use my phone or my iPad. The words are bigger and I can jump around to different channels translation. So, but if you have your uh, phones, your Bibles, you can go ahead and be pulling that out. But before we get into today's story, I need to do a quick recap of last week's message to kind of get us to where we're at in the story today. Because what I love about Judges is it it reads more like a story or a movie. Um, You know, there's a lot of different books in the Bible. Some of them are like poetry. Some of them are very historical in nature. Some of them are like letters that are written. But Judges reads like a story. It's like a history book and, and the stories in the book of Judges are really neat. So here's where we're at. Israel is a nation that was set apart by God to be an example to the other nations around them of what God's blessing looks like when you when you follow God and you have his blessing, right? Um, and, and they were all set up to enter into a land that God had promised for them called the promised land. Now, all Israel had to do and the start of Judges was just go into that land and take it for their own. It was inhabited by a bunch of different tribes and nations. And all they had to do was go into that land and, and do war against those nations and drive them out. God had already promised them victory. But what they did instead was uh, they doubted God's power. And instead of fully driving out all of their enemies, they, uh, they allowed some of them to stay. They didn't get rid of all of them. And so now where we find Israel is they are forced to live in and among these different, um, these different tribes and these different countries that uh, you see from people that they were around. And, and the problem with that is not that it's not a good thing to like live next to people that are different. No, the problem was that these, these different cultures, uh, they all served different gods, and they all had different religious practices that were much, much different than what God had set Israel to do. And so instead of Israel staying strong and being an example for all of these people, uh, they ended up uh, being led astray by these different gods and the practices, the religious practices of their neighbors. And so that led God to be very upset and disappointed with the Israelites. And so um, since the Israelites wanted to look and serve uh, the gods of their neighbors, God let them. And so God, we see God um, allowing the Israelites to be overtaken and overcome by these different nations. So they were no longer an independent nation anymore. They were um, un- under the oppression of these different enemies. And so um, after a while, though, Israel became tired of being oppressed and having to serve these kings and these other enemies uh, like they would. And so they would cry out to God for help and for salvation. And so God would raise up for them a deliverer or a judge that would uh, that would slay whatever king was in charge and help uh, drive out the enemy that was oppressing them. And so Israel would again be a free nation and that judge would lead the Israelites back to God for a time. And this whole cycle is the basically the pattern of the book of Judges. It's called the sin cycle, right? It says in verse 12, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So they fell right back into the same mistakes that they made. So there are two things that we need to learn from Israel right off the bat so that hopefully we we don't make the same mistakes that Israel made. And hopefully we don't get stuck in the same cycle because that's not fun, right? Nobody likes to be oppressed by sin. Nobody likes to do that, right? But there are two things we need to know. The first is this, that regret leads to regression. 
Regret leads to regression. You see, here's what happened to the Israelites. They never actually repented. They never actually said to God, I'm sorry for what we did. Would you please forgive us? No, no, no. All they did was say, oh, God, I'm tired of being oppressed by this evil person. Would you please help us out? And God answered them, right? But Israel never re actually repented and said they were sorry. All they did was regret their actions. So here's what regret leads to. Regret leads to regression, which means going right back to where you started. You see, regret looks like this. Regret means that you, um, this is God, and you're heading in the wrong direction, right? And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a place that you don't like. And instead of saying, God, I'm sorry, would you please get me back to where I was? You say, oh, I don't like being here. Um, man, I wish that I was back where I started or I wish I was over here. Or I wish I was over there. And that's what regret does. It, it's not making any steps to, to move in the right direction. And the problem with regret is that if you regret something often enough, you can trick yourself to thinking that it's the same thing as being sorry for something. And you can trick yourself mentally into thinking, oh, I'm actually heading back to God. By regretting my actions, I'm heading closer to God. But actually, regret leaves you in the same spot. And then what happens is as soon as um, another uh, temptation, another sin, something shiny comes around, right? What happens is you find yourself exactly in the same spot as you were before, if not a little farther away. That's Regret, and that's where regret leads you. But on the other hand, repentance leads to restoration. Repentance leads to restoration. You see, repentance uh, looks like this. It's heading in the wrong direction, but then realizing, oh, this is not the right way. I, what I'm doing is wrong. And turning 180 and starting to head back in the right that's what repentance looks like. It means, ah, I, I know what I'm doing is wrong. I recognize that, and I'm tired of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn in the opposite direction and start heading back towards God. And what repentance does and what God promises us is that when we, when we repent of what we're doing wrong, God promises that he will restore us back to Good is new. Now, we won't be the same person, right? We, we always learn from our mistakes and, and grow and get better, so we won't interchange. So we won't be the same person. But repentance will lead us back towards God, right? And, and, and it will lead us away from where we were. And, and unfortunately, that's where Israel finds itself. It's not in repentance, right, and leading themselves back towards God. They find themselves in regret. And so because they just regretted their mistakes, they found themselves very quickly right back where they started, which is under the oppression of another king and another kingdom and tribe. And that's where we're going to pick up our story today. So Judges chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Let's read that together. And the people of Israel, again, did was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. 18 years. So now Israel is under the rule of a new enemy. Now, Eglon was the king of Moab. And something that's really interesting about the Moabites, okay? The Moabites were actually related to the Israelites. They were like distant cousins. See, the Moabites trace their lineage all the way back to a guy named Lot, okay? And the guy, um, Lot, was the nephew of a guy named Abraham, right? And so Israel, they traced their lineage back to Abraham, right? He was the father of Israel, and he, all the 12 tribes traced their lineage back to Abraham. Well, Lot was Abraham's nephew. So the Moabites, right, and actually the, um, the Amalekites were both related to this guy named Lot. And so uh, the Moabites, as such, they kind of looked like Israel, they talked like Israel, and they were very similar in a lot of ways to the Israelites. So it would have been very easy for the Moabites to just kind of come in and, um, and be neighbors with the Israelites. And they were neighbors. In fact, I've got a map that shows you exactly where 
uh, Moab was. You see, Moab was on the other side of the Dead Sea from Israel. So Moab was in what's modern day Jordan, all right? And you got the Dead Sea right there. That's where Moab is. In fact, from Moab, you can actually see over into Israel. All right? I've actually been there, and you can see from Moab, you can see into Israel. It's really cool. And so the Moabites were really close to Israel in a lot of ways. Okay? Um, and so it would have been really easy for the Israelites to start getting kind of buddy-buddy with these guys. And um, gradually, instead of serving their God, start serving the God of the Moabites, who um, was uh, the Moabites. They, they've uh, uncovered a lot of ar- uh, some archaeological um, stuff about the Moabites. And the Moabites served their God. And they referred to their God um, in a lot of the same ways that the Israelites referred to the one true God. So in Israel's mind, it would have been very easy for them to kind of get the muddy, the waters get muddied between the two. And then all of a sudden, they look up and, oh man, we're serving uh, this other God and this king has overtaken us, right? And so um, here we have Moab. Now, Moab was under the rule of a guy named King Eglon, all right? And the Bible describes Eglon as a very fat man, all right? A very fat man, which is really interesting that um, out of all the things that they could have used to describe the king, he was very fat, okay? So they, here we have Israel. They're under the rule of a very fat man. And Eglon, his name actually means a circle or the fattened calf, all right? That's what the name Eglon means means, okay? And Eglon means the fattened calf, or to go around in circles, okay? So um, that's where we find ourselves. Israel is under the rule of this fattened calf, right? This large bull, all right? Um, and, and so let's pick up the story in verse 15, all right? So the, then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. So Israel, they've been under the influence of this fat king for 18 years, right? And they've been kind of spinning in circles. They've not been going anywhere. They're in the same place that they were. And so they get tired of this. And so they think to themselves, oh, I know the last time we were under oppression by the Canaanites, we cried out and asked God for to help. So maybe if we do the same thing again, he'll, do, he'll raise up another deliverer. And he does. And so God raises up a guy by the name of Ehud, son of Gera, the left-handed Benjamite. Now, Ehud, son of Gera, the left-handed Benjamite. There's a lot of good stuff in that title. So I want to focus in real quick on the fact that he was a Benjamite, okay? So the Benjamites were really, really cool people, all right? So like I said before, Israel is made up of 12 individual tribes, or really large families, right? Judah was the largest tribe, and they were the strongest, The Benjamites were the smallest tribe, okay? They were the smallest tribe, but they were perhaps the most fierce. You see, they were known as being fierce warriors. In fact, their uh, their symbol was kind of, uh, was a wolf, all right? So they were fierce warriors, all right? They were known for uh, being ambidextrous, which means they could fight with their right hands as well as their left hands. So this ability um, to fight with both their right and their left hands was maybe one of the reasons that the author included the fact that Ehud was left-handed. But it could also point to the fact that uh, of how they trained. You see, when they trained, the Benjamites, they would actually bind up their right hand and put it behind their back so that it was rendered useless. And then they would train with swords and slings and arrows with their left hand only, being their right hand being completely disabled. This gave them a really, really distinct advantage on a, ba- on a battlefield because most people in those days fought right-handed, and so you didn't expect to come up with a left-handed enemy, Right? But being left-handed could also mean something else. Actually, um, it was really cool in our community group last week. Um, we have a lady who um, reads in both a Spanish version and an English version. And she kind of paused when we came to this like left-handed. And she said, well, hey, I've got a question. She said, in my translation, it says that his hand was in a fist. Right? Instead of saying uh, Ehud, the left handed man, it said Ehud, the man whose hand was in a fist, was basically the translation. Right? And, and it's really interesting because, again, it could point to uh, the fact of how they trained, but some people think that maybe 
Ehud might have actually had a physical disability to where his hand was maybe withered or in a permanent um, fist type of shape, okay? Now, we don't know this for sure, okay? This is speculation, but it could be. That is one of the possibilities, which is really cool. But regardless of whether he was physically disabled or not, this is a true underdog story. We have the smallest tribe, right, from, from a, a people that have been under oppression, right? And, and we've got this guy who's going up against this massive king. But it's a really cool example of a really powerful truth that we see throughout Scripture. And the truth is this, that God loves to use our weaknesses to show off His strength. God loves to use our weaknesses to show off His strength. He loves using the underdogs, the ones that that people don't really think much of, and He loves to use those people to show off His strength. Check it out. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says this, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Ah, I love that. So God uses what is weak to, to topple the strong. God uses um, what, what seems to be foolish to confound, to confuse what is wise. I love that. So here we have the sm- average guy from the smallest tribe who was possibly crippled, and his enemy was this larger-than-life evil king who was oppressing the people. And that's the setup for a really cool movie. But we're not going to watch a movie. We're going to read. It is. And so we're going to, but instead we're going to read straight out of scripture, okay, the story. And I thought about like telling it and tried to find a video, but like it just, the word of God is, is, is just does it well enough. So um, bear with me. We're going to read this story together. Judges 3, chapter 15 through 26. You guys hold on to your seats. This is going to be good. All right. So the people of Israel sent tribute by him, talking about Ehud, to Eglon, king of Moab. So tribute could mean anything from like gold or maybe food. He was very fat, right? So maybe he sent a whole bunch of food, right? So they sent tribute to him, to Eglon, king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it to his right thigh under his clothes. I'm going to pause real quick, all right? So, um, People, when they went into battle, okay, if they fight with their right hand, what side would their sword be on? It would be on their left side. And so when um, the guards and when the people were checking for weapons, they would have probably just checked the left side of their body. They wouldn't have checked the right side. So the reason that Ehud, it was important that he was left-handed, is he bound the sword to his right side, okay? And so the, the, the guards probably wouldn't have thought to check that, okay? So he bound it to his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And the king commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and stabbed it into the belly of the king. Told you it was exciting, right? And stabbed it into the belly of the king. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. And when he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, well, surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited until they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. And there lay their Lord, dead on the floor. And Ehud escaped while they were delayed and passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sariah. All right. I told you I didn't need to storytell anything. That's like straight from Scripture, which is amazing, right? 
So this story reads more like a, a script from an HBO show, right? More than it does something you would expect to find in Scripture. But uh, it's full of adventure and, and trickery and deception and violence, right? But if we just read it at face value and take it as a cool story, um, we, we can miss some really important and cool truths, right? So last week, we learned that we have access to God's power. We have access to God's power. And this is the only thing that is strong enough to break out of the cycle of sin. And last week, though, we said that, listen, it's not enough to, for us to just know that we have access to power to break sin, right? We talked about how in order to actually break out of sin, um, I'm a very practical person, in order to actually take ourselves from where we are now and r- remove the sin from our lives, in order to break through that cycle, we actually have to do battle with the sin in our lives. That's what we talked about. We have to do battle with that sin. But last week, I didn't really give you any tools of how to do that. This story provides the tool, the weapon that we can use in our battle against sin. Right? Did you, did you catch it? The, the weapon that Ehud used in the story was a double-edged sword. All right, and that's very specific, right? That's a very specific sword, okay? But it's not the only time we see the double-edged sword show up in the Bible, okay? We see it a couple of other places in the New Testament. Hebrews 4, chapter 12 says this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Ephesians 6, chapter 17, um, paraphrase says this, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So our primary, and in fact our only offensive weapon that we have against our enemy is the Word of God. That is our sword. You guys could say amen or something. That's all right, you know. It's good. This is our primary weapon. This is what God has given us in the fight against sin. This is what God has given us to fight our enemy. His word, the word of God, the sword. And it is sharp enough. It is powerful enough to cut through bone and marrow, sword and flesh and spirit. It is powerful enough to defeat whatever sin is in your life, right? And I love that, um, that in this story that Ehud used a double-edged sword to slay the king and therefore free Israel from the sin that they were in. And that's what we need to do as well. But how do we do that, right? How are we supposed to use Scripture to actually attack our enemy? All right, I told you, I'm a very practical person. So if you just say, yeah, use Scripture to attack your enemy, um, you might find me outside going like this to people. Get away from me, go, right? <laughs> so, but that's not what we're supposed to do, right? We're not actually supposed to hit people with the Bible, all right? It's not, that's not, um, <laughs> I'm not telling you to do that. But what we're supposed to do with it is this. We're supposed to read it. We're supposed to spend time with it. Now, um, I love the detail that, uh, that God included. And Ehud made himself, for himself a sword. I don't know about you uh, if you've ever watched somebody make a sword. I'm a closet nerd. I love that sort of thing. And so um, I've actually spent time and watched people make a sword on YouTube, um, in real life. And it takes two things. It takes a lot of time and a lot of patience to actually make a sword right? It takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. Even to make something as crude as this it takes time and patience, right? You have to really know what you're doing. And then to learn how to use that sword, right? It's not enough to just have a cool sword sitting around like, yeah, this is awesome. You have to learn how to use it, right? And in order to use it, learn how to use it, it takes those same two things, time and patience, right? And so the same thing is true With the Word of God, in order for us to learn how to use the Word of God, our weapon properly, it takes time and it takes patience. Now, the act of of thinking about something over and over and spending time about something and, and letting it, chewing it over, over and over in our brains and in our minds, we call that meditation. Okay, and, and, and the scripture tells us that um, all over that we need to meditate on the word of God, that we need to think on the word. That's what that is. Meditation is just simply thinking about scripture over and over and over and again and letting it soak in, chewing it in. 
And maybe not so coincidentally, Gera, the name Gera means meditation. Now, if you remember, Gera is Ehud's father. Now, his name literally means to chew the cud, all right? Um, but if you uh, have seen cows or animals, you know that what that means is they, they do something over and over and over and over again. And this phrase, chew the cud, is synonymous for meditation in Scripture. And so how powerful is it that we are supposed to be chewing on Scripture over and over Gera, we're supposed to be meditating on the Word of God, and that's how we learn to use it. So some of you are probably thinking, all right, wait a minute, I thought our anti-hero was Ehud, right? What does his name mean? Well, his name means praise and thanksgiving. It's good stuff. His name means praise and thanksgiving. So that means this, when we spend time meditating on God's Word, we are sharpening ourselves to be sharp with the Word of God. And then as we spend time in the Word of God, that will lead to praise and thanksgiving, which is declaring God's power and victory over sin in our lives. You see, declaring God's power over, with, our, uh, with our words and actions is the definition of praise and thanksgiving. And praise and thanksgiving, they seem so small and insignificant, right? I know, like, whenever I hear people say, well, when you're attacking sin, you need to, you know, spend time reading the Word. You need to get accountability to part your partners around you. You need to do this and that. You need to smash your TV, you know, or your computer or whatever you're doing. And you need to, like, cut your eye out if it's causing you to sin and chop off your arm, right? I mean, there are, like, some extreme people out there that will tell you to do some crazy things when it, when it comes to battling temptation, Right? But here's the key. What actually was the thing that wielded the sword? It was Ehud. So praise and thanksgiving. That is how we vocalize the Word of God, right? And so when we spend time meditating on the Word of God, when we know Scripture, when we know the promises of the Bible, when we know um, what God has, has said that He will do, we know how strong it is, right? That will, that will let us know the power of God and how strong He is and that He's strong enough to do that. And then once we know how strong God's power is, once we know that we have the ability to break out of that temptation, that's when we start declaring it. That's when we start saying, God, you, I know that you are strong enough to break me out of this sin. I know this is not where you want me to be. And I'm telling you that you are strong enough to do that. And I am giving you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for everything that you have done in my life and everything that you will do in my life. And that is praise and thanksgiving. And as we praise and praise and echo these praises over and over and over, both in our quiet times and in when we're around other people, people and in church and and on the streets or when we're in our car and we're singing along to the radio right and as we're praying when we're echoing and we're saying those praises of thanksgiving over and over that's when we are slicing and dicing through sin because if we're thinking about God and his power and and the power that he has that is how we break out of the, the cycle of sin. That's how we slay the devil. That's how we slay temptation, is by echoing the praises of God. And that is what will help us in our battle against sin and temptation, right? Praise and thanksgiving is simply putting into words the truths that we read and hear. So meditation gives birth to praise and thanksgiving, which is the sword, um, which when we use scripture, is the sword that slices through sin and temptation, right? Gera gave birth to Ehud, and Ehud slayed the king, and that's what liberated Israel. Isn't that cool? Oh my goodness, that's awesome, right? I know, I love it. The Bible is awesome. So um, what does that mean for us, okay? What does that mean for you and me? Well, if I asked um, everybody in this room to give me five things that you didn't like about yourself, most of you could list off ten, okay? I could do the same thing, okay? So we know what our weaknesses are. We know what our flaws are. Uh, some of our weaknesses are a little bit more pronounced than others, right? Some of our flaws are a lot more visible than others. Some of our sins, some of the things that we struggle with, um, are a lot more apparent than others, Okay? Ehud was from the smallest tribe. 
He was just a normal guy. There was a good possibility that he could have a physical disability, right? So he was faced with a couple of different options. It would have been very easy for him to point to all of the weaknesses and flaws that he had in himself and say, well, God can't use me. There's no way because of this and this and this and this that God would want to use me or could use me. And if he had done that, he, God would have raised up another person to deliver Israel. I, would have, I truly believe that. But Ehud would have missed out on this amazing opportunity to be used by God. But that's not what he did. Instead, he did not give up. He said, you know what, God? I know that I'm weak. I know that I might not be the strongest or the best, but I know your power. And so instead of letting his weakness or his disability or his position define who he was, he allowed God to turn his weakness into God's strength. And that's the main point. That's what I want you to come away with today, is that God can turn your weakness into his strength. The, the fact that Ehud was left-handed, he was small, he was insignificant, that was his greatest strength. God was able to use that to topple a king and to lead Israel to deliverance. So if you are, are sitting here and you think that God can't use you because of X, Y, or Z, that is so wrong. In fact, I would tell you, the greater your weakness, the greater the opportunity for God's power to shine through. Think about that. The greater your weakness, the, the, the more unqualified that you think you are to be used by God, the greater the opportunity for God to step in and make his power known through you. That's why God likes to use people who are weak is so that when they do amazing things, they have no choice but to point to God and be like, I didn't do that. That was him, <laughs> right? Strong people tend to think a lot of themselves, and so um, they, they miss opportunity to be used by God. So whatever you think, wherever you think you are, if you think that you have a physical um, disability that God can't use you or that God doesn't value you or think that you're important, oh, that is so far from the truth, right? If you think that because of a sin that you've committed or, or a lifestyle that you've fallen into, that God somehow um, thinks that you are uh, like disqualified or unusable, that is so far from the truth. God sees that as an opportunity to come into your life for you to repent and start heading in the right direction and God will restore you and God will use you. And, and the more God uses you in spite of your weakness, that will cause you to have all this praise and thanksgiving. You know, say, look what I'm doing. Even though I started way over here, look where God brought me and look what God is doing. And as you tell people about what God has done in your life and what God is doing in your life, that will cause more people to be amazed and try to, to, to figure out, man, th who's this guy that you're serving that can take even somebody like you and do these amazing things with them and that will cause more people to come to God and be curious about God and that will point others to him and that is the good news that God wants to turn your weakness into his strength and he will turn your weakness into his strength if you'll let him I don't know about you but that is good news that is such good news but like we talked about at the very beginning, this comes with a warning. You see, Israel, again, they did not repent from their sins. They were not sorry that they started serving other gods. They were not sorry that they started serving uh, the Moabite gods. No, no, no. They just got tired of being under oppression. So unfortunately, as soon as Ehud died, they found themselves right back where they started, and even worse. So my challenge for you today is this. Repent. Where are you at? Is there something in your life that you need to surrender to God? Do you need to, do you need to stop where you're at and turn around and start heading in the other direction? Because if you do that, if you do that, God will take you with open arms and you can begin to fight against the sin in your life and you can begin to defeat the sin and, and the cycle of sin that, you, that, that God has that you have found yourself in. And when you start doing that, God will start doing amazing things, things that you never dreamed that you would be able to do if you repent and start heading back towards God. But if all you do is say, man, I wish that I could, you know, 
be uh, in a different place or, man, I regret doing that and that, that's just, man, I, I regret that. And all you are is filled with regret instead of repentance, you'll find yourself right back where you started. So if you um, need to talk to Charles or myself about anything that we talked about today, maybe about repentance, this idea of chasing after God, maybe you're like, man, I didn't think that I could be used, but maybe I want to be used by God in some way. Come and talk to us. We're a small church, and so I promise you there's a place where we can use you, where God can use you to do amazing things things for him. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you think your, your disability is. God can use you in big ways, and he will use you. So if you want to talk to Charles and I about any of that sort of thing, man, come on and do that. And just as a teaser for next week, all right, we're going to be talking about how women save the day in a very unexpected way. You won't want to miss that. Let's pray. Hey, God, I just thank you so much for your word and your truth. God, I thank you that you have equipped us with the sword, um, which is your word that can slice through the sin in our lives, that can, that can give us freedom. God, I just thank you for that. And I thank you so much that you love us and you're willing to do whatever it takes for us to come and find you. Father, we love you so much and we thank you for what you're doing in this church and we thank you for everyone here. And I pray, God, if there's anyone here who feels like um, walking in, they felt like they could never be used by God, that, Father, you would give them the courage to realize that you can use them. And it doesn't matter where they are, you can use them. So, Father, I just pray that you would give them the boldness and the courage to come back and talk to Charles and myself today about how they can be used by you. We love you so much, and we thank you for everything you've done for us. And it's in Christ's awesome and powerful name that we pray. Amen.